Well, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, yes, I'm Andrea Ferrara. And uh, so uh, we will have three mornings together. And uh, so uh, the organizer, the director of the school, has asked me to talk about uh, cosmic reionization. And, uh, and uh, this, is a, this is a very broad topic uh, that involves a number of uh, uh, physical uh, processes and, uh, and also cosmological uh, milestones that uh, we try to cover at uh, least uh, broadly in, in these three lectures. So uh, cosmic reionization is a, is a key process through uh, cosmological evolution. And sometimes it's called as a, as a, is a, uh, it's called a phase transition, the last phase transition of the universe, even though I don't like very much this definition because, after all, uh, it's not a sudden process. So this is the first thing that we have to learn, that realization has been actually a relatively smooth and gradual process that has turned uh, most of the, uh, of the uh, cosmic gas, which is, as you know, uh, essentially hydrogen and, and helium, has turned it from a neutral state into uh, uh, an ionized state. As I've already said, uh, cosmic ionization uh, is a process that, in, that involves hydrogen, but also helium. And so these two ionizations, in principle, uh, occur uh, slightly different times because of the different ionization potential of the two species. We will go through these details. But uh, we, when, we, when we talk about cosmic ionization, usually people means hydrogen ionization, even though uh, helium ionization is also important, as we will see, for several reasons. Now, cosmic ionization, as I said, is such a process. It's very important. So why do we care about cosmic ionization? We care about ionization because, um, essentially, uh, the impact of this process on the structure formation, galaxy formation, uh, intergalactic medium, uh, and many other, uh, many other properties, observable properties of the universe have been uh, tremendous. So there is a very strong, the universe would, be, would look very different from what we, we observe today uh, if ionization would not have occurred. And so it, it makes sense to study uh, the interplay between structure formation and, and cosmic ionization. Uh, there is obvious a link between these two, these two type of uh, uh, processes, and so the next, the second line of my of my title is uh, how do we study? Well, the, we, as we will see, there are several ways to study uh, uh, cosmic ionization from the experimental point of view, uh, and uh, maybe the most important one is just to use uh, the fact that we are looking at hydrogen. Hydrogen is emitting radiation uh, in the 21 centimeter line, and therefore this appears to be uh, a perfect tracer uh, to do the step-by-step uh, -step study of ionization uh, through cosmic times by looking at the evolution and of the intensity of this line. Sometimes uh, we talk also intensity mapping in the line, so this is something that will become clear uh, later on. But so the idea is just to use this line that is emitted by hydrogen to study how hydrogen is actually disappearing due to uh, ionization and is turned into some uh, proton and electron that are not uh, combined anymore. So uh, what is my lecture plan? These are the three lectures that we will have today, tomorrow, and on Wednesday. Uh, so I've divided the, the uh, lectures in three parts that, uh, that we need to go through in order to have a coherent framework of uh, reionization. So the f as, the, uh, as reionization affects the diffuse gas that is called the intergalactic medium, or sometimes also the circumgalactic medium, uh, so we will need to discuss uh, key properties of, of what we know about the intergalactic medium before we go into, into the uh, actual topic of cosmic ionization. And so cosmic ionization is essentially divided in, the, uh, in two parts. Uh, what is the theory? How do we study theoretically the process by which uh, the universe gets reionized? 
And the second part in which we also need to uh, discuss uh, what are the sources of ionization. These are, as we will see, this is a problem that is very uh, open. We have some ideas, but we don't have a, a firm conclusion on what sources uh, actually uh, have driven realization through, uh, from the beginning to, uh, uh, to the realization epoch that occur about uh, one, one billion year after the Big Bang, as we will see. And finally, we will, uh, as I was mentioning already, we will look at how we can study uh, the EOR, the Epoch of Reorganization. This is the acronym that is often used. EOR is the Epoch of Reorganization that is uh, meant to define the epoch from which Reorganization started to the time at which it was completed. And so I will also introduce the, the physics of the 21 centimeter line uh, intensity mapping and the way in which we can use it. Uh, I, I like to stress that the 21 centimeter mapping is not only uh, uh, is, is a tool that can be used to study organization, but not only. Uh, probably uh, we, you will uh, hear, or maybe you have already heard, about the use of 21 centimeter also to study uh, other types of, of, of uh, large scale problems in cosmology. So it's a uh, I guess it's an important future uh, technique that we will use uh, for all these problems. So before I, I actually start, also I need to give you some uh, references. There is a lot of literature in the, uh, in the field, and uh, so at least in the, in the last 10 years, there's been a lot of activity. And uh, so I'm just referring to, to the, to the uh, reviews that are I have personally used to prepare the lectures and something that I also uh, am certainly definitely happy to suggest. Uh, they go from some more historical material that was uh, pre, say, uh, pre, uh, well, I don't know pre what, but anyway, it was before 2007, uh, and then the most recent material that is scattered a little bit in, 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 different, uh, in different reviews, and you can find others, of course, but uh, these are the ones that, that um, I, I will be mostly using during my, during my lectures. So uh, lecture number one, so the intergalactic medium. So let's, let's start to look, uh, to define and, and see what are the properties of the intergalactic medium, which is definitely, uh, it, broadly speaking, is anything left after you form galaxies. So you put some of your gas, some of the cosmic uh, material, which is, as you know, hydrogen and helium left over from the, from the Big Bang. You put some of it into galaxies, whatever is left. Let, let us call, let's call it, for the moment, the intergalactic medium, okay? So intergalactic medium is a diffuse component of the universe which is not condensed or collapsed into bound objects as galaxies. So this is the working definition for now. So the, the IGM, intergalactic medium, so this is the acronym, the uh, IGM physics is commonly uh, the, the birth of, of this type of... Uh, Physics is, is commonly dated back to uh, 1965. So what happened then? It happened that uh, uh, an observer, uh, Martin Schmidt uh, in California, discovered uh, or, or was able to take the spectrum of, the, of uh, what was then the most distant object. There was a quasar called 3C9. It was located at the redshift, which today appears almost ridiculous, right? To redshift 2.1, which seems, uh, you know, yesterday for us. But uh, it's actually, at that time, it was the most distant object known. And so that observation was very challenging uh, because, you know, you used the best possible technology available at the time. But uh, the discovery of this quasar <clears throat> Uh, was very uh, fundamental in, in, in understanding uh, things that, that were not clear before. In particular, when, uh, when Schmidt uh, showed uh, in, a, in a talk at Caltech, uh, he showed the, the spectrum of this quasar, uh, a young postdoc, maybe like you, was sitting in the, in the, uh, in the audience. His name was Jim Gunn. And uh, he immediately noticed something that there was light, there was transmission of photons even beyond at energies that are larger than the ionization potential of the hydrogen 
uh, of the hydrogen atom, which is 13.6 electron volts or 1912 angstrom. So the, 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 the spectrum of the quasar was showing there was some transmission of, of light even uh, in ionizing photons, so photons that uh, should have been absorbed by uh, intervening uh, hydrogen along the line of sight. Okay? So that was very surprising. And so GAM uh, noted that and uh, he immediately said, oh, this is very important for cosmology. Why? Because the fact that we were, uh, that Schmidt was able to observe this, this light uh, from uh, uh, high energy photons meant that there were two possibilities. So either galaxy formation is, was very efficient and therefore all the cosmic gas was in galaxies and so the intergalactic space was completely empty. So the photos were not absorbed. That was hypothesis number one. Hypothesis number two was that the gas was still there, but was in a state that was unable to absorb the ionizing photons coming from the quasar towards us. That means that the, those atoms should have been totally ionized. Okay? So uh, they work out uh, together with uh, another uh, smart guy, Bruce Peterson, so Gunn and Peterson, uh, just work on this problem. In one week, they turn out with a paper, a fundamental paper that we will study better later on, that was claiming that quasars could be used to study the state of the intergalactic gas, and therefore we could understand how much of this gas was in galaxies, and also what was the state of the, of the uh, intergalactic medium. And they concluded that the intergalactic medium had to be completely, almost completely ionized right, to explain the observation. So that was the first uh, hint of the physics or, or the properties of the intergalactic medium and was also the birth of, uh, of the intergalactic medium science and also maybe of realization because we, we uh, for the first time, we firmly saw that the, the IGM was ionized, at least by right shift two, okay? Uh, so, uh, and finally, we also learned that we can use quasars as uh, lighthouses to pierce line of sight through the intergalactic medium, uh, along which we can study the physics of the intergalactic medium. So this is uh, uh, the, the, the first thing. So uh, let's, <coughs> let's become a little bit more uh, quantitative. And uh, so uh, this is a, uh, this is a, uh, kind of uh, budget of the, uh, of the gas, uh, of the material, and the, of the barriers, actually, that are uh, in the universe that was put together by uh, Fukugita and colleagues a few years ago, and that, that shows uh, uh, a few things. So we have here a number of components that uh, are evalu whose abundance is evaluated at redshift zero. So we have three columns, the central value and maximum minimum. So just look at the central value. These numbers are given in units of the critical density. So they show the density parameter of that particular component, right? So uh, first of all, you may expect, if I ask you, so now at redshift zero, where are all the baryons? Where, where, what is the component in the universe that, that contains most of the baryons? Probably naively, uh, uh, you would reply, OK, well, maybe stars and galaxies. Wrong, wrong answer. Because in fact, if you look at this, uh, consider the sphere. OK, the total of this is the, uh, the total that we have, that, uh, that we observe, for example, from the CMB. So this is 0 0.021, which is the omega baryon, okay? So the value of the, the density parameter of baryons are at zero. So this is the total that we need to uh, explain. So how is it distributed among different components? So if you look at stars and by, by far the, the spheroids like you know, elliptical galaxies or uh, large uh, spheroidal systems uh, contained most of the stars, but as you see, they make it up barely to something like 10%. So only 10% of the baryons today are in stars and are in mostly in elliptical galaxies. So this is the first lesson. But so where is the rest of the 90%? It's in the intergalactic medium. So even now, 
a redshift zero, the intergalactic medium is important because it contains 90% of the baryons that we know have been created by, by nucleosynthesis. So uh, this is a very important thing to appreciate. And, so, and if we further ask, so and within the IGM, uh, where, are they, uh, where are they distributed? Now I'm introducing yet another acronym, which is ICM, which is the intracluster medium. So there is also, uh, historically, there's been a little bit of, uh, there's a little bit of ambiguity between the two terms, so intergalactic versus intracluster, but you know, uh, sometimes they are used uh, in an in a almost in interchangeable way, but uh, in principle, uh, they are different, uh, as we will see. So if we ask now, how is the gas that is not in galaxy distributed among different components? Well, we see that the most important, uh, the most important by far, the most important uh, component is plasma in groups. Okay, so this contains almost 60 60 percent or 70 percent of the baryons uh, in the intergalactic that are not in galaxies are. In, in plasma that is uh, surrounding small groups where maybe 10 or 20 galaxies. Uh, so this gas is floating around these galaxies, the one that uh, contains most of the material, but there is also uh, warm uh, plasma in clusters or cool plasmas uh, around, around uh, in, in truly in the intergalactic space. But so all these four diffuse components make up uh, about 70% of, of the barrier. So the intergalactic medium, there is a lot of mass in the intergalactic medium. This is the takeaway message. Um, and so can we have a, a little bit more quantitative uh, uh, understanding of, of uh, why, uh, why, of another important property? So this gas, the, uh, the IGM and the ICM, is relatively warm, if not hot. Okay, so why is it this high temperature? So you know, for example, the, the mean temperature of the gas in a galaxy like our own is of the order 8,000 8, K, so it's relatively cool, okay? So most of the gas in the Milky Way and in other galaxies are below 10 to the 4 K. However, if we go into the IGM, the gas is always hotter than that. It could, come, it could get to 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6, and even 10 to the 7, okay? So why is that? Well, one way to understand uh, why the intergalactic medium is warm, hot, is uh, because it's very simple. So the idea is that as structures are forming and the gas collapse into, into the uh, filaments, as we will see later, collapsing filaments and structures, so uh, it's, it's heated up by uh, shocks. So the accretion shocks that are, that are forming as a result of the collapse of this, of this uh, otherwise diffused medium into filaments and sheets, uh, then uh, the, the shocks convert the gravitational energy of the collapse into thermal energy. So very, to, to the very zero order, you can uh, say that the, the velocity at which uh, that is uh, related to the uh, collapse is essentially the wavelength of the linear perturbation that is becoming nonlinear over time, which uh, over the time that it takes to collapse. And this kinetic energy has to be converted into, uh, into thermal energy that is uh, expressed in terms of the sound speed of the gas. The sound speed, I recall you, that uh, is proportional to the square root of t, so t is equal to cs squared. And so if we say the time uh, is the inverse, uh, is the Hubble time, and so the inverse of h, so uh, we get that the temperature, by simple, simple uh, dimensional analysis, we find that the temperature by redshift zero has to be of the order of 10 to the 7k. Okay, this is the, essentially the maximum that you can reach, then there is dissipation. But, so that explains why the kinetic energy of the collapse of structure turns the gas into, through shocks, uh, turns the gas into a, a hot component. So the IGM is usually warm, hot. Okay? So most of the gas, it's, uh, it's uh, heated up by uh, structure formation shocks. So shocks related to structure formation. Now. Uh, in order to see this in a, uh, in a, in a more uh, graphical way, 
uh, let's, let's look now at these different components. So there is gas at different, at different temperature because, of course, the gas that is related to larger, larger, uh, uh, larger fluctuations that are connected with uh, clusters is hotter than the groups and is hotter than single galaxies. So there is a hierarchy of temperatures. And so we see uh, the, the gas is divided in terms of uh, different. So we are looking at the volume feeling fact, volume fraction uh, filled by a given component. So you have galaxies, and then you have uh, very hot gas, intermediate, and, and warm gas around 10 to the 5. So you see, as a function of redshift, you find that uh, by far the, uh, the volume is filled by gas, the cosmic volume is filled by gas with uh, temperature of the order 10 to the 5. And 10% is instead at even higher temperatures uh, that is essentially related to cluster and very large groups. Okay? So this, this uh, uh, as, as expected from the previous argument, as you go from redshift 3 to 0, uh, the, volume feeling fra the, the volume fraction filled by hot gas is increasing. And this is because the uh, larger and larger structure are collapsing, and therefore the temperature that we derived before are getting higher. So there's more uh, structure formation of uh, large structures that can uh, heat the gas up to the 10 to the 7K. We can do the same now and look at the, instead of the uh, volume filling factor, uh, we can look at the mass fraction in the different components. And here we see something uh, different, but essentially reflects what I said before. So the cold, uh, this cold gas now, it's in terms of mass, is decreasing from uh, 90 more percent uh, a redshift three, so a redshift three. Remember that more than 90, more than 90 percent of the gas it's relatively cold, so it's temperature less than 10 to the five. But that cold gas is disappearing in favor of this warm gas produced by structure formation shocks. So uh, by redshift zero, you see that the situation is now reversed. We have uh, most of the gas, about 60% is, is warm, and then we have some cold gas, 30%, hot gas, 20%, and galaxies, the 10% that I told you before. So 90%, if you sum up cold, warm, and hot, this is all the intergalactic medium that uh, it's outside galaxies. So uh, star formation in galaxies can only rely on 10% of the available gas in order, to, in order to form stars, and the rest cannot be or has not yet been uh, put into, into bound uh, systems. So this is the uh, first, uh, first uh, overview of the intergalactic medium, but we can also uh, learn more about the uh, about the uh, processes that are that are and the distribution of this gas in the cosmos. So for that, uh, we have not been able yet to directly image the distribution of the gas because, of course, it's very diffuse and the absorption light, uh, absorption light techniques that I was mentioning before can only allow us to study the one dimensional. Uh, distribution of the properties of the intergalactic medium, but we cannot have real maps yet uh, of the intergalactic medium. Maybe we will in the future, uh, but as, a, as a, uh, we will discover later. But uh, so far we have to, <coughs> I'm sorry, I have a bad call today, um, I have to rely on, on a numerical simulation like this one, which are showing uh, uh, the uh, this is also this is essentially uh, uh, factor, factoring out a scale. It's true for any redshift. So this is a typical distribution of the of the baryons uh, in the in the and dark matter actually in the in a given field. This this one is a 10 by 10 megaparsec uh, inverse H uh, volume. So you see there are a lot of filaments here, and these are exactly the filaments that I was discussing before, where the gas is, is squeezed into these, into, into these uh, filaments, and because of that, it, it becomes hotter. Uh, and so there is a, a lot of structure, and then you see these small dots here that uh, actually uh, are, the, are the galaxies that form exactly where the, uh, where the IGM uh, is... Uh, 
uh, there are crossings between the, the filaments. So in, at, the, at the knots of the, of the filament, you, at the crossings, uh, you form these tiny dots that are the galaxies. Now you see immediately from here, uh, one of the key, uh, key properties of the intergalactic medium that is that the intergalactic medium is fundamental in driving gas, uh, guiding the gas onto, uh, onto galaxies. So, it's, uh, so all, all this accretion of gas onto galaxy feeds the star formation activity into a galaxy. So the IGM is funneled into, into uh, collapse or, or uh, virialized system like the galaxy, and this gas is the, is the fuel to form uh, stars, uh, stars uh, in galaxies. But as we will see later, and actually we'll see even better in the next slide, galaxies react back on the, on the, on the intergalactic medium. So there is a crosstalk between the intergalactic medium and galaxy. So how do galaxies feed back? Well, this is, uh, it, it happens that the, the gas that is funneled into, into the galaxy uh, very rapidly goes and forms stars, for example, and the stars uh, start to inject energy, and in particular they, through uh, radiation and also uh, supernova explosions. And so this gas, it's, the, 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 the stars try to stop the info, okay? So there is a, is a battle between the intergalactic media that try to, uh, to pierce into the galaxy and the galaxy that reacts. And you can see clearly the, uh, the feedback, this feedback effect as it's called, so the, the galaxy feeds back on the intergalactic medium. Uh, from the, the same map, but now we look at the temperature map. So it's the same simulation as before, but now you see that we are showing, uh, uh, we are looking at the uh, temperature, uh, temperature map, and you see that around, uh, you see these yellow uh, regions here, uh, where the, uh, these are the, uh, the, ga the galaxies, where uh, star formation are starting to push out winds. Okay? So the winds are coming from, from the galaxy and they expand into the intergalactic medium and they work against the infall of gas that is trying to come down into, onto the galaxy through the, through the filaments. So uh, there is a, a, strong interplay, uh, uh, a strong interplay between the intergalactic medium and the galaxies, and that tells you immediately that uh, if you change the properties of the intergalactic medium, for example, through cosmic ionization, then uh, the properties of the galaxy that you would get in an in, in universe in which ionization is drastically changed will be also drastically changed because it changed this interplay uh, between the intergalactic medium and, and the galaxies. Uh, we can also have a better look of the, uh, to a very important uh, diagram in, in the intergalactic, that, that characterizes the intergalactic medium, which is called the phase diagram or the equation of state that relates uh, the temperature. Of, so this is uh, taken again from the simulations, but uh, this is in very good agreement with, uh, with data as we will see later. But from, from the same simulation, we can look at the uh, equation of state or phase diagram that relates the temperature of the gas with respect to its over density. Now the, uh, in, in IGM, uh, physics, we often, uh, rather than talking about densities in absolute density, we talk about over densities with respect to the cosmic mean. So this is uh, denoted by delta. So uh, log delta equals zero means it's the mean density of the of the uh, in, of the of the uh, gas in the of the barriers in in the universe. And then if you go to negative value, you are living in an under density. If you have positive value, you are living in regions that are more dense than the average. So the. Uh, of course, as you go to very large over density, you enter in the realm of, of galaxies. Uh, for example, uh, we are already at uh, these points here have over densities are that large, are largely nonlinear. So the uh, intergalactic medium is usually uh, considered, uh, I mean, it's, a, it's an arbitrary definition, but the, the, the realm of the intergalactic medium ends at over density of roughly 100, uh, where the perturbations start to become nonlinear and therefore they, they start, uh, start to form uh, bound objects. Now, if we concentrate then on, on this part, we see that that, that denotes the, the, the true IGM. 
Now you see that the, the temperatures uh, range from uh, roughly uh, 10 to the, 10 to the well, a few thousand Ks up to uh, a million K, uh, and this, is, uh, this one is at Reggie 4, okay? So this is at Reggie 4, just so that, that the equation of state changes uh, very much but uh, as a function of redshift, but uh, after ionization it remains more or less stable uh, and this, uh, uh, with this shape that uh, essentially tell us a little bit about the physics that we are going to learn in the next, uh, in the next few slides. So the idea is that uh, the, the, the IGM is, the, the temperature of the IGM is, is, uh, is not only uh, determined by, by the shocks, as I was uh, discussing before, that are able to create million degree gas, but you see that there is also a lot of gas that is uh, in, the, in the cold phase. Remember that I told you that Redshift 3, 90% of the gas is in this cold phase uh, with temperature of the order of uh, 10 to the 4, or 10, between 10 to the 4 and, and, and 30,000 K. So this, is, this gas is it's not uh, shock heated, but it's, or not yet shock heated, but it's photo ionized. It will be photo ionized by uh, UV radiation that we will discuss in a second. So the, the phase diagram is the combination of gas that is photoionized, which is, by the way, the majority, if you look at the, this is a, a mass-weighted uh, distribution. So uh, you see that the green here means that most of the mass is here in the cold component, uh, in agreement with what we said before, but it's also a considerable amount of gas that is uh, heated by, by the shocks uh, by structure formation, but also by supernovae, as we've seen before, okay? So, uh, so now, uh, we have this, the, something like that, and uh, so how do we, how do we study it? Uh, how can we make a progress? Uh, so this is essentially, we are still uh, stuck to the idea uh, by, by uh, Gunn and Peterson. So what we do is just uh, we pierce line of sight through the intergalactic medium. So suppose uh, we have a quasar, which is a very luminous source. Uh, it has also, also, galaxies can also be used, or, or gamma ray bursts can also be used. Anything which is bright enough that, that it has a spectrum that is uh, simple enough that you can uh, easily understand, and quasars certainly do, it can be used as a background source, as a background lamp uh, through which you can uh, shine uh, a light through the intergalactic medium, and so what, what you receive is the filtered uh, quasar spectrum. So you see the spectrum of the quasar, but now it is filtered through the, uh, the filaments that I showed you before. So these are uh, the filaments that uh, I was showing you in, in the previous slide, so like these ones. Sorry. So suppose that now we are piercing this box through with the line of sight, and uh, what, what we are uh, passing through is a number of uh, uh, filaments that contain some uh, neutral hydrogen. So the light of the quasar are photons that have uh, energies larger than, than the Lyman alpha uh, line are, are uh, essentially scattered by this, uh, by this gas and uh, they are pushed out of the line of sight. That it's equivalent to us uh, as to an, an effective absorption, absorption process because we are losing that photo from the line of sight. And so what we observe <coughs> is something like this. So this is a, a, a typical spectrum of a quasar that uh, it's filtered through the, uh, it's filtered through the, through the intergalactic medium. And immediately you see uh, a number of things. First of all, uh, you notice that the most prominent line is the Lyman alpha, uh, the Lyman alpha line that corresponds to the transition from level two to level one of uh, the hydrogen atom that is emitted by the quasar itself. But as you see that uh, what happens here is that uh, as you go to uh, shorter wavelengths, therefore you go to higher energy of the photons, then you start to see this, uh, this uh, incredible number of absorption features. So these are all absorption features that are uh, have some a structure that, that uh, is reminiscent of a forest, and that's why it's called the Lyman forest, Lyman alpha forest. Okay, so it's a forest of absorptions that uh, 
are not, uh, has, have nothing to do with the, with the quasar itself, but they are imprinted by the intergalactic medium. So as, as at any time in which you pass through one of these filaments, for example, ear or ear or ear, then that structure in space leaves an absorption or better scattering uh, imprint into, into the quasar spectrum, and therefore you can uh, see it directly reflected into, into the spectrum of the quasar. So, uh, so each line here corresponds to a discrete absorber that contains sufficient neutral hydrogen so that uh, the, uh, the, the quasar spectrum is, is absorbed, the photons from the, from the quasar are absorbed, and uh, we see them uh, as absorption features. Now, uh, it's interesting to note that uh, the inter intergalactic medium, there is a, a little redshift uh, 3.5, uh, there are not only, uh, there's not only hydrogen and helium, as we would have expected from pure Big Bang, uh, conditions, but we also already see a number of features. For example, look at this one. This is a, a very prominent one. There's two lines. This is the doublet of a, what is called a, 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 an absorption feature related to the uh, carbon atom. It's carbon in particular ionization state. This is uh, three times ionized carbon. Uh, and you see that this feature is very prominent. That means that in the intergalactic medium by redshift three, uh, there is not only uh, hydrogen and helium, but there are already heavy elements that have been uh, injected by galaxies. Remember, we were discussing about the winds before, and these winds are not only carrying energy and momentum into the intergalactic medium, but they also carry a lot of, uh, a lot of heavy elements. And these heavy elements are, uh, although they are very relatively rare, uh, they are, for example, they are typically 1,000 times more rare than in our galaxy. In spite of that, we can see them uh, uh, imprinted in, in, in several transitions, carbon, silicon, and oxygen, and we see many, many species. So the intergalactic media has already been uh, subject to injection of energy and, uh, and also polluted with, with uh, heavy elements uh, by uh, early on. So how early, we will see later. Okay, so uh, this is the, the uh, the general overview of what we do expect uh, in, in general terms. So let's do a little bit more, uh, a little bit more of physics now. So uh, I thought, yeah. Say it again. Uh, do I see the Gump Peterson effect in? In that plot that is. In that plot? You mean here? This one? Yeah. I mean, the, uh, I have to explain a few things more. We will see in the next few slides. But essentially, you can uh, compute the tau Gump. I've not introduced the Gump Peterson yet, so if you can wait for a second. But yes, we, we, do, a certain, we do a tau. We, observe, we can compute an optical depth, the Gump Peterson of the optical depth. And in this case, uh, it turns out, I don't know the precise value, but I'll show you later a plot that shows how it evolves with redshift. So we do, yes. The answer is yes. But sorry, it's a, it's a bit, I, I have to introduce a few more things because I, before I can go in, in more details. So uh, I was, I was told, telling you that uh, actually, uh, probably for the true intergalactic medium at high redshift, uh, because it's a, the uh, structure formation shocks has not yet been uh, uh, able to uh, eat it up to very large temperatures, so most of the gas is cold. We saw 90% as a number, as a guideline, 90% of the, of the gas is it's cold, the redshift uh, above 3 or 4. Uh, and so what is eating up this gas to the temperature of 10 to the 4 that we are observing? Well, this is mostly due to, uh, it's a photoionization process. And uh, I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you later what is producing the, uh, the, where the energy comes from. So this is a very simple slide that, uh, however, uh, shows the basic, uh, the basic physics that you need to include if you want to compute, for example, how much neutral hydrogen is uh, present in the intergalactic medium and what is the temperature that you would expect. 
So uh, there are two things that you need to compute. The first is the photoionization rate, and the second is the photoheating rate. So the photoionization rate is the tells you how many ionizations. That means how many times a hydrogen atom is uh, divided by its own electron, so it's ionized per unit time or per second. So this is the, uh, it's called gamma, gamma H1, and it's nothing else than the, the, the integral from the uh, minimum energy that you need to give to an hydrogen atom in order to strip away the electron, which is one Rydberg, or 13.6 electron volts, uh, to infinity. So you can use all photons that have energies larger than that. Uh, and so this is the energy density of the radiation field that the atom sees, and this is A of nu, which is the, um, which is the cross section for photoionization, which typically depends uh, to the uh, frequency to power minus three. So uh, as, as soon as you go to larger and larger energies, the uh, ionizing power decreases, okay? So, uh, at the same, at the same, in the same way, you can uh, every time you every time you, you divide the electron from the you, or you give energy to electron uh, to to be stripped away from the uh, hydrogen atom, that the excess energy that that you have given to the atom goes into kinetic energy of the electron. So this electron then uh, thermalizes by collisions with, with the uh, rest of the gas, and that corresponds to an heating rate. So almost inevitably, every time you produce uh, an ionization, you also heat up the gas, because you give uh, more energy than you need, usually, and then uh, this extra energy goes into kinetic energy of the electron, and the electron uh, distributes this energy to the other particles, okay, by thermalization process. So there is a heating rate that is related to the photoionization rate. So given what I said, it's not surprising to see that the expressions are uh, between the photoionization rate and the photoheating rate are very similar. Um, and, and the only difference is that here we have uh, an extra factor that uh, gives the uh, difference between the actual energy of the pinging photon with respect to the threshold energy for the ionization of that piece. Now, this has been done for uh, hydrogen, but of, of course you can do it for any species, any atom. In practice, there is also photoionization not only of hydrogen, but also of helium, and all the other, if you have other species like carbon, silicon, heavy elements, that would work the same. Of course, hydrogen is the most abundant by far atom, and therefore we are caring about that. So with these two numbers, the photoionization rate and the photoheating rate, you can learn a lot about the uh, properties of the IGN. So if you're able to compute those numbers, then uh, many things can be derived up to then. So the first thing is that uh, you can write a simple equation that tells you how, uh, what is the, uh, the evolution, the time evolution of the fraction of the gas which is in neutral form. And this is XH1, which is the ratio between the uh, density of hydrogen, neutral hydrogen, with respect to density of, of hydrogen atoms. So this is simply, uh, uh, this is a detailed balance equation that uh, simply uh, is, is uh, uh, determined by two terms. Uh, the first is the fact that the neutral hydrogen fraction decreases as you uh, ionize uh, the gas, and this is the ionization rate there. So uh, you see that this, this is a negative term that tends to decrease the, the abundance of neutral hydrogen. And the second one is the balance, is, the, is a process that balances the ionization. And this is due to essentially recombination. So uh, if you have a, an uh, electrons, a bath of electrons and protons at a given temperature, there's a certain probability that they recombine and form a neutral hydrogen. And so that depends on temperature and is called the recombination coefficient. Uh, and, and there's also a uh, proportion to the number of, electro, of free electrons that you have, the density of free electrons that you have available to do this uh, recombination. So this is uh, something that also uh, is a, a similar equation, although uh, I mean, not exactly the same, uh, with respect to uh, what that you use when you study the cosmic uh, recombination uh, epoch, right? So when you study cosmic recombination at all, uh, that also gives rise to the, uh, to the physics of the cosmic microwave background. So the process is exactly the same, even not 
uh, with some, some differences due to the uh, different conditions. So this is the first equation, and then the second is just a, uh, essentially a conservation of uh, the number of uh, 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 hydrogen atoms. They say that the, the, the sum of neutral atoms and other ionized atoms uh, has to be constant. So uh, if you solve that equation, you find that at equilibrium, so you say, uh, you forget about the time evolution. Uh, if you look for a uh, time scale that are short enough for the, uh, that are sufficient for the uh, ionization to reach a, a steady state equilibrium, then you find this uh, equation that tells you that actually the neutral hydrogen fraction at equilibrium it's, uh, it's a very simple expression. There is essentially proportion, uh, proportional to the uh, recombination rates and uh, inversely proportional to the uh, photoionization rate. Of course, the larger is the photoionization rate, the lower is the fraction of neutral hydrogen that, that you have available at the end. So you can do the same for, uh, so this is a, a fundamental uh, equation that very simple, but it gives you an idea of, uh, of uh, given uh, the condition of the intergalactic medium, what is the uh, fraction of atoms that are in the uh, neutral state. And you can also uh, write the, uh, the energy equation. So these are called the ionization equations. These are the, called the energy equation that deal with the balance of uh, energy that, uh, that, that you're providing. Because as I was saying before, so for each ionization, you produce also some heating. And, and so you're photo eating the gas. But the gas is also losing energy because uh, it, it emits uh, radiation. We will see that more clearly in the next slide. And so uh, this, this uh, photo eating term has to be uh, diminished by the amount of radiation or cooling uh, losses that the gas is, is suffering. So uh, I'll, I'll specify later uh, what this function is, but for now it's just a function of temperature that uh, expresses the uh, cooling of the gas. So uh, this, this term is the, the usual expression for the entropy, and the entropy is a function of time, uh, uh, evolves like, like this. Uh, this is the energy equation that written in a, in a specific way. And so you can also get the temperature from, um, by solving that, you can get the temperature. The interesting thing is that if you uh, are likely, if you want to know how the uh, temperature of the intergalactic medium evolves, well, we see that this is proportional to the ratio between the photo heating rate and the photoionization rate. So as a function of time, uh, this will evolve uh, in this way, so uh, there's a proportionality. Now, I was telling you about this function uh, of the, so you're eating the gas through some form of radiation, uh, photoionizing it, but you're also losing energy uh, because the gas is cooling. So what, what is producing this cooling? Uh, this is a, a very important uh, function, uh, not only in, in for the intergalactic medium or, or you know, for galaxy formation, but also for interstellar medium. It, it enters essentially everywhere. So this is a function called the cooling function that expresses the ability of a gas that is sitting at a given temperature that has been heated up at temperature T to lose its thermal energy uh, by carrying away with uh, photons, with radiation, okay? So you're, you're, you're losing the thermal energy of the gas. And so the way in which a gas uh, uh, does that uh, depends essentially on what processes uh, at a given temperature are able to create photons that carry away the thermal energy. So you convert thermal energy into uh, radiative energy, which is lost from the system. So... Uh, it makes a lot of difference if, uh, if uh, on, it makes a lot of difference uh, if your gas has a primordial composition like hydrogen and helium only, or if there are also uh, pollutants like uh, heavy elements or more more uh, heavy species like carbon, oxygen, and, and silicon, the, the one we were discussing before. And, uh, and this is clear because uh, the more uh, atoms uh, you put, the more species you put, the more uh, available process you have, the more lines you have available in order to transform kinetic energy of the gas or into, into radiation. 
So for the primordial, uh, in, in the simplest possible case, which is, by the way, for the, for the uh, intergalactic medium, it's, it's an extremely good approximation because we see that it, most of the gas is just hydrogen and helium with traces of, of uh, uh, heavy elements. So the primordial gas to a first approximation, the primordial composition to a first approximation is a very good, uh, gives us a very good idea uh, for, to, 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 to perform actual calculation. In fact, even in the most sophisticated numerical simulation still, we are using uh, this cooling function because the, the contribution from heavy species is essentially uh, close to zero. Now, uh, the, uh, this is the cooling function, so that means this is the, uh, the energy lost by uh, a parcel of, of, uh, of gas at temperature T uh, per unit time, uh, per unit uh, volume. Now, uh, you see that the, the solid line is, is the, uh, the total of the, of, the, uh, uh, of, the, of the curve, so it's the actual curve. But there are also, uh, what I'm, I'm showing here, are also the uh, different processes that are contributing to, to uh, build up the, this curve. And as you see, there are the most prominent one that, that gives you these two peaks are the, uh, is, the, is the cooling related to the uh, Lyman alpha emission. So, for example, what this plot is telling us if you have a gas with temperature of roughly uh, 20,000, 30,000, K, it will lose a lot of energy because this gas is hot enough so that the electrons can excite the neutral atoms, excite them to level two, they decay into a Lyman alpha photon, that Lyman alpha photon is gone, and that energy has been lost by the system. Okay? So this is, this is why uh, this, uh, you have this peak, and you have the same for, for helium, okay? So helium uh, is slightly higher energy. So these are the two most important processes. So Lyman alpha cooling, uh, both from hydrogen and also from helium, is the key uh, cooling species for, gas, for, for a gas of primordial composition around uh, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 5 um, uh, Kelvin. But there are also continuum processes like uh, free-free, recombination, uh, and, and, and others that are not even listed here. So, but most of the, most of the, most of the, 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 mean, the, the peak of, of for what is uh, concerning us, uh, it's essentially uh, Lyman alpha excitation and also free-free when you go to very uh, high, high energy. So this is the cooling function. One thing that you may note here, is that uh, because uh, this, the, uh, the cooling function is dropping to zero uh, below 10 to the 4K. So that means that uh, in a primordial uh, composition gas with temperature, uh, sorry, with a primordial composition gas, it's impossible to cool that gas below uh, essentially 10 to the 4K. So there's a sharp drop, and there's no way to cool that gas below uh, 10 to the 4 by radiative processes. Of course, you can always do it by adiabatic expansion, okay? That, that's a different thing. But purely from, from uh, uh, radiative losses, it's impossible if you have a gas which is not expanding, that is, that is bound. For example, if you put that gas into a galaxy and, and you don't have uh, any other way to cool the gas, the gas will remain at 10 to the 4K. So it's only when you start to pollute that gas with a lot of uh, 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 heavy elements that a new branch will appear here, uh, and that's what happens in inside galaxies. But we are not discussing uh, galaxy formation here. We just, if we restrain to the IGM, it's, so the temperature uh, cannot go below, the, the key point is that the temperature cannot go below 10 to the 4 by uh, radiative processes. It can only go below that if you uh, expand the gas through adiabatic expansion. So this is a very uh, important point. Now, remember that, one, let's step back one, one, one sec. So before I was, I was uh, when I was discussing the photonization rate and the photoheating rate, I was uh, mentioning that the, there is a UV uh, which is the energy density of radiation, okay? Both in the photoionization rate, but also in the photoheating rate. I did not specify uh, up to this time what is the, 
what is the source of this radiation? So where is, what, is, what is you? I mean, or at least, what is the relevant uh, energy density of radiation that heats and, and ionizes the, the IgM? Well, this is called, for the IgM, uh, this, the, the, this comes from a background of radiation that is called the ultraviolet background, or UV background, okay? So this UV background is produced by all the sources that emit light. Uh, they could be uh, quasars and galaxies, or could be also other sources, as maybe we'll see later. But essentially, the first approximation is quasar and galaxies. So uh, obviously, the energy density U uh, is a function of redshift. And also, uh, it has a spectrum that depends on what type of sources are emitting that, that radiation. So uh, what, do we have an idea of, of this uh, UV background? Well, this is something that we, are, uh, we, have, we have ideas, and we have good models, and we have some tests. Uh, there are, we are not 100% sure exactly if, for example, there's a long-standing debate uh, if the UV background is mostly produced by quasars or galaxies, and the, the relative balance between these two type of sources is actually very debate is an open problem uh, in, in this type of studies. But uh, at least theoretically, with some assumption, we can compute the uh, the evolution and spectrum of the of the uh, intergalactic uh, ultraviolet background. Okay, so the, this is the mean background that uh, a nitrogen atom sees. So in this figure, I show you exactly uh, the spectrum of the, uh, of the uh, UV uh, background that is shining on top of this uh, uh, of the intergalactic medium, and we are seeing as it evolves from redshift seven or so uh, down to redshift zero. So these are units of KV. So and I just put the line here just to show you where the ionization potential of the hydrogen is. So remember that uh, only photons with energy larger than that are entering in that integral in the photonization rate because you see that uh, we need to, uh, these photons that are below this threshold of 13.6 eV, they, they just do not ionize the, the, the hydrogen. So uh, one thing that you may notice is that starting from uh, high redshift to low redshift, uh, there is a there is a, a substantial change in the in the shape of the of the inter, of the uh, UV background uh, and the spectrum is is determined by a number of uh, radiative uh, transfer process because this radiation of the UV background is filtered through the uh, IgM so if you want to uh, measure it as a function of, of redshift for example uh, we need to uh, clarify how the uh, evolution occurs but you can see for example that um, there's a there's a in the in in, in there's a well uh, there's, there's a lot of variation in, in in terms of the spectral shape uh, one thing to appreciate is that uh, the UV background strictly speaking can only be uh, established after ionization and the reason is that uh, when I say UV background when people refer to background means some uh, uh, radiation field that uh, whose intensity is independent on location Okay, so if I measure the intensity here, it's the same that here. So it's homogeneous. Okay, uh, and and this is what is called a background. Usually, a background is, shows uh, very little fluctuations, uh, very little spatial fluctuations. However, uh, the uh, this is clear that before ionization, when there was a lot of neutral hydrogen uh, still uh, floating around. Uh, a true uh, background could not be established because the, the fluctuation must be very large. For example, if you are in an ionized region, the intensity is high. If you are in a neutral region, the intensity is low because it's absorbed by the uh, hydrogen itself. So, the, uh, strictly speaking, we should only talk about uh, a UV background after the completion of ionization, but uh, with this caveat in mind, we also extend it to uh, larger, larger redshift. So uh, this is the, the final, uh, the, the redshift zero background. And so we see that these are the, um, 
the theoretical expectations, and these are measurements that we have available uh, today. So you see that there is a very good uh, agreement. So we, we think we have uh, a good idea of the uh, of the background, at least a lower redshift. So we we are confident that we can extend uh, the, uh, the extend the the. Uh, prediction of the model to, to very high redshift. Of course, as I said before, as you enter the reorganization epoch, things become a little bit more uh, uh, difficult, but uh, at least as a, as a first guideline, uh, this is fine. So again, this is the uh, same thing, but with a different view of the, of the spectrum that uh, allow us to appreciate a few features. So this is, uh, again, the intensity of the UV background, which is usually measured in these units of Erx per square centimeter per second per Erx per square radian. Um, from redshift 2 to redshift 5.5. Uh, 5. And you see that, the, uh, that uh, there is uh, an evolution. You see features here that are prominent, and uh, I don't know if you can recognize them, but these are essentially the, uh, the Lyman alpha line and the analog for the uh, helium uh, atom. So these are the lines that are, uh, these are emission lines that essentially uh, are due to, uh, they, they, they are produced any time that there, there are recombinations between electrons and, and protons. So you have these lines which are more prominent at high redshift, and then they, as you see, they, they decrease and almost disappear as you go to very low redshift. And this is because the uh, lower redshift, they, essentially there is no very few uh, neutral hydrogen atoms left to, to produce a Lyman alpha line. So the Lyman alpha line is disappearing very rapidly. So this is our understanding of, of, the, uh, of the UV background. And so we can, we can use this to uh, perform uh, uh, calculations of various types. and, and this, these calculations that are typically done through numerical simulations can then be compared with actual data, okay? So in order to make this comparison, we need to learn a little bit more in detail uh, how we, uh, a, few, a few things about how we measure, uh, how, what type of measurements we are making uh, on the intergalactic medium. So, uh, so, as, as I was saying before, most of the studies so far, but we'll see that things are changing with the 21 centimeter that we, I will discuss later on. Uh, so far, the intergalactic media has been studied mostly uh, through this quasar absorption line, so the Gamm Peterson idea, okay? Um, and uh, in, historically, uh, all these studies started when the, 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 the resolution, the spectral resolution of the instrument and of the instruments were uh, relatively small. Uh, people were looking at a quantity uh, that is <coughs> it's called the flux decrement of a, of a spectrum. Uh, this is called like uh, D sub A. And uh, it's, uh, it's nothing else than the average over all the uh, um, over all the absorption features that we saw before in the Lyman alpha forest, so we average over all these discrete absorbers of this quantity, one minus the observed flux divided the continuum flux. So in other words, let me show you uh, again this, this figure that we were looking before, right? So for, so, you, so what that, that formula says is that for each of these absorption features here, you compute the ratio of the uh, absorption flux, the flux that is uh, absorbed with respect to the one that is uh, the continuum of the quasar. Of course, you need to know where the continuum here is, so this is also a tricky point, but you may uh, imagine to draw, uh, a, a connect the points here with a line, and that will be the continuum of the quasar, which is now uh, all, uh, featured by, by this absorption uh, feature. So if you do, uh, you can construct the quantity, which is the D sub A, the uh, flux decrement, by averaging over all these discrete uh, absorption features, this quantity, and uh, you can therefore determine uh, an effective optical depth. So I come back to your question before. So F obs is the observed or residual flux, what you see at that specific frequency and then the estimated flux of the uh, unabsorbed continuum. And so uh, this is, you get the tau, which is the line optical depth as a function of uh, wavelength or redshift, which is the same. 
So, uh, of course, as I was mentioning, you need to know exactly what the continuum level that the, of the quasar is uh, over, over large regions. But uh, so you, usually what you do, you extrapolate it from regions that are red of the Lyman alpha emission line where uh, the Lyman alpha forest is not present. So you try to, uh, to fit a power law to the, to the spectrum. And so you get the, uh, the, optical, uh, the optical depth as a function of, of uh, redshift. Now, uh, this is how, how you get it from your spectra, but then you want also to, uh, to understand how this tau uh, is physically determined. So in, in actually, your uh, effective, uh, this effective tau that you have just measured in the way that I described uh, is the result actually of, uh, of an integration over three quantities. Uh, that is the, uh, the number of absorbers you have along the line of sight, their Doppler parameter that I, decide, that I describe in a second, and the uh, redshift interval okay, that you have. So this is uh, the, the effective tau, then it's the uh, one minus the tau of each individual, uh, individual absorber, which is determined by N, which is uh, the, uh, the column density of, of gas, that is the, the density integrated along the line of sight, times and also by the Doppler parameter. What is the Doppler parameter? Well, the Doppler parameter is, uh, gives you, uh, gives you the, the, uh, essentially the, uh, the width of the, of the full width or maximum of, of the line is related to the, to the width of the line, uh, that you are, that of the Lyman alpha line that, you are, that is scattering the, the, uh, the photons. Uh, and uh, it's a function of the temperature. So this is the uh, temperature of the gas. Uh, over the mass of the hydrogen atom, plus uh, some uh, extra uh, um, uh, broadening of the line, which is not related to a uh, thermal effect, but is also due to uh, bulk motions of the gas. So the, the Doppler parameter is uh, the sum of the square root of, of, uh, of the sum of, the, of these two broadenings, okay? So if you now uh, assume that uh, the, uh, the column densities and the, and the uh, and B, the Doppler parameter, are independent on the on redshift, uh, and you assume what is usually done, that you can write uh, the, this quantity, this function, uh, as, as a product of the uh, redshift evolution times the uh, properties of individual observers, then you uh, can write the effective uh, optical depth in this way, uh, and uh, where, where you define also the uh, rest frame, the equivalent width of, of the line, which is nothing else than the amount of, uh, the amount of light that you are uh, absorbing uh, within the line width. Okay, so this is the equivalent width. So this is the formal expression for, for the optical depth. And so uh, having, having made the connection between theory uh, and observation, you can also try to obtain something from the spectrum. So what do you do? Well, so this is a, a much uh, expanded view of the quasar absorption spectrum that I showed you before. So you see the spectrum is the, uh, is, is the uh, blue lines here. So what you, what you do, you try to, um, uh, in the, to, to fit to each absorption feature that you observe in the spectrum uh, a number of components that come from individual, individual observers. So, uh, so you try to model each uh, of the absorbers that the, uh, the light ray finds along its path into, into different components, each one characterized by uh, a Doppler parameter and a neutral hydrogen column density NH1. Uh, I recall that the column density is the integral of the number density of, of hydrogen integrated along the line of sight. So it's a unit of one over an area, so one over a centimeter square. And uh, okay, so you, you find, uh, you do, uh, this what is called the void profile decomposition, so you fit void profiles. What is a void profile? Well, you know that the lines, uh, atomic lines, as a, as a, as a, they have a, a natural line width, which is described by a Lorentzian, and then they have this Doppler, uh, 
uh, extra Doppler uh, broadening that is described by a Gaussian. So a void profile is uh, an empirical form that uh, for the profile of the for these profiles that you are trying to fit to the lines, that it's uh, uh, it's a, a convolution between the Lorentzian uh, Lorentzian natural broadening and the and the Doppler broadening. Okay? So you fit these void profiles, and for each observer, you can find these two quantities. So you can find uh, how, width, how large is, uh, how wide is the line, and also what is the uh, column density of that, of that specific absorber. And so what you get from, from this type of exercise is for, uh, are a number of information about the, the individual absorbers. So the first is the, uh, the distribution of, uh, of the column densities of different absorbers. And it turns out to be, uh, uh, so these are data, the, the points are data. So we have the number or the, uh, yeah, the, the frequency of, of the of, uh, absorbers with a given column density shown here in, in, uh, in H1. So these are the, uh, the data, and these are uh, results from the numerical simulation. So you see that they fit very well. Uh, and it turns out that this uh, function is essentially a power law of, uh, of the column density to power minus 1.5. <clears throat> so uh, now we know that this, uh, this uh, power law extends to even larger column density actually goes down up to 10 to the 20 or even 21. So there is a, is a very simple uh, distribution of the column densities of the absorbers uh, as, a, as a power law that uh, uh, actually uh, can be understood uh, is in agreement with what uh, numerical simulation predicts. So that means that numerical simulation are able to catch the, the physics of structure, of structure and filament formation coupled with a good treatment of the UV background and the photoionization rate uh, of the gas. So we, are, we, are, uh, we think we understand uh, the, 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 the physics of the Lyman Alpha Forest to, to a very good extent. And so note that also this uh, functional form is almost independent of redshift. So from redshift 2 to redshift 6, there is no much change in, the, in, the, in this functional form. So this is one thing we have learned. The second, uh, we can also learn about the temperature from, from the data. We can learn about the temperature of, of the gas. This is a little bit more uh, tricky because if you plot, for example, look at these plots. We are plotting the, uh, the Doppler parameter, which remember is proportional to the square root of the temperature as a function of the uh, neutral hydrogen column density and see that there is a, a scatter there, but you see there is also, a, a, there seems to be a minimum line. Now, why is that important? Well, this is important because if we want to uh, measure the temperature of the intergalactic medium, of course, the, the Doppler parameter is telling us something, but remember that the Doppler parameter contains also this term, which is the turbulent uh, broadening. And so when we measure something, we measure the total B, while we would like to know only temperature, but there's also these extra terms that, that uh, confuses us a little bit. And in fact, this is, uh, this is reflected into the fact that the B parameters uh, at any given uh, column density uh, have a spread. Uh, and which could be produced by the, uh, by this do the uh, turbulent broadening. But this line here is, uh, sets like a minimum of these points, and we can think that this is what we, could, we would get if the turbulent motion would be equal to zero. So it's not straightforward to obtain the temperature directly from B, but we, know, uh, we can have at least a uh, uh, lower limit to the temperature set by the lower envelope of the, of the distribution. Now, uh, with that technique, we can also reconstruct the evolution of the temperature of the intergalactic medium, of the photoionized part of the intergalactic medium, which, again, at high redshift is essentially the, almost the totality of the gas. So the temperature, as a function of redshift, um, you see, it's, it's initially decreases. So if you're coming from high redshift, it decreases down to redshift 3. 
and then apparently shows a, a sudden uh, jump here and then it decreases again. Now, how do we understand that? Uh, uh, well, the first part, it's almost obvious because uh, we, as I was mentioning before, the IgM is cooling down as the, uh, because of expansion. So it's, it's adiabatically expanding and so the temperature drops. But uh, and, uh, there's uh, this intermediate phase here of, uh, of uh, apparent reheating of the, of the IgM. It goes from a few times then to, well, 10,000 K to maybe uh, 50,000 K. That it's uh, commonly associated with the uh, extra heating due to uh, helium reionization. So while, uh, as we will see later, uh, hydrogen ionization was completed around redshift six or so. The helium, uh, uh, the helium ionization, that means from helium uh, singly ionized to helium doubly ionized, was only completed later on, and so that process uh, may have left an imprint in the temperature uh, due to the extra heating, the photo heating produced by the uh, full ionization of helium. Now, there is a lot of debate on this. The data are difficult exactly because of the fact that it's difficult to interpret the B as purely due to temperature. So uh, this is another open problem. So uh, if uh, helium ionization has truly occurred at redshift three, uh, and if the eating connected to that has been responsible for this apparent jump uh, in, the, in the temperature that, that we see. Now, uh, here we come to the, uh, where we started from, that is uh, the most important uh, uh, way to characterize the reionization, one of the key quantities that, that are often used to characterize reionization is the so-called uh, Gunn-Peterson uh, optical depth, okay? So this is a paper by Gunn-Peterson, 1965, and this is the original formula that they used. They were not talking about the optical depth, but something uh, similar in, in non-dimensional units, which is P, so it's the probability of a photon to be uh, scattered as it travels to, uh, towards us. So this probability is the integral between zero and the, and the given redshift. And so this is N, which is the number of hydrogen atom along the line of sight. So this is the frequency, uh, sorry, this is the cross-section computed at the frequency uh, appropriate to uh, the redshift. So this is the Lyman alpha frequency uh, uh, which the, the photon can, uh, can be absorbed by the, uh, can be scattered by the neutral hydrogen. And this is the mean free path um, along the radial direction expressed in, the, in, uh, in commoving coordinates and as a function of redshift. So the cross-section sigma uh, uh, for the Lyman alpha is very simple. So it's a product of uh, fundamental con constant times the oscillator strength. And this is the line profile. So if you do the, the integral, uh, assuming uh, a density which is uh, uh, evolving like one, one plus e to the cube uh, as a function of redshift, then you get the uh, standard formula for the uh, gum peter So the, the, this is the solution to that equation. And in the more modern uh, way, which you can usually find it written, it's uh, with the uh, coefficients that are uh, the cosmological parameters that are extracted and put in evidence. Uh, so you see that uh, the Gunn Peterson is a uh, tau, so this is the optical depth of the Gunn Peterson uh, as a function of redshift, depends on, uh, first of all, it depends on the cosmology. So it depends on the cosmological parameters, like uh, the, uh, this is the uh, matter density parameter, uh, it depends on the uh, Hubble constant and the, uh, the density parameter of burials, and it depends on redshift as power three halves. So immediately you see that as you go to higher redshift, the, you would expect from simple basic principles that uh, the optical depth should increase, and it increases because uh, this, this term is driven by the increase of the density, of the mean density of the universe as you go to high redshift. So uh, as you go to sample higher and higher uh, uh, sources, then you would see towards them uh, an optical depth which is increasing. But also it depends on the, uh, on the relative abundance of uh, hydrogen atoms with respect to the total number of atoms. 
uh, total hydrogen atom. So this is what we called before the XH1, so the neutral hydrogen fraction. You see that the important thing is that this number is very large. Uh, the coefficient here in front of that is very large. It's uh, roughly 5 times 10 to the 5. That means that even if you, uh, if you put here a, a number, uh, a, a neutral hydrogen fraction as small as 10 to the minus 4, then you still, uh, you're, uh, that still gives you an optical depth which is much larger than 1, and so you have a complete uh, Gamm-Peterson absorption. So the, the, uh, actually, that depends on the fact that the cross-section of the Lyman alpha is very large. And so uh, as soon as you have a little bit of neutral hydrogen, the uh, absorption capacity of that uh, little amount of neutral hydrogen is very large. So that would obscure uh, very distant, very distant uh, quasars. And, uh, so this is the original paper of Gunn and Peterson that, uh, that I, I strongly recommend you to read because it's a very nice reading. It's also an example of how you can write uh, a very important uh, uh, scientific result in a little bit more than two pages. So it's just very short and sharp, uh, clear. I mean, it's beautiful. So uh, go ahead and read it. And so uh, I think I'll, I'll just finish for today by showing you what we, what we know about the, uh, the, <coughs> the data. So this is the Gunn-Peterson effect I just, uh, show, just uh, uh, illustrated. Uh, you see that we have quasars, uh, spec different spectra from quasars located at redshift 5.7 up to uh, redshift 6.37. And you see immediately that, apart from the fact that the, uh, the Lyman alpha feature, which is the peak here that I showed you also before, is shifting towards larger wavelengths. This is expected because we are going to higher redshift, so it's just a redshifting of the, of the photons. But you see that uh, while the Lyman alpha forest that was very prominent, remember the, the original plot that I showed you of the quasar with uh, redshift 3, so there was a lot of Lyman alpha forest, a lot of features here. See that these features here are disappearing, and more so as you go, to, uh, to go towards high redshift. And this is because each individual, uh, because the Gunn Peterson optical depth becomes uh, larger than one as you go to high redshift, and therefore the, all the radiation that is uh, shortwards of the Lyman alpha gets completely uh, blocked. Uh, it's interesting to know that even if, on average, the, you see that the, the, the flux goes to zero uh, here, there are some regions of, of transmission. So that means that even at redshift uh, 6.2, uh, that there are also some, there are still some, some uh, regions where the gas is locally a little bit ionized, so it allows a little bit of transmission of these photons. So that means, that indicates that the uh, reionization is the first in that the reionization is a little bit patchy. So some regions have been ionized, some others are not yet completely, and we will see this uh, later on when we study the reionization. So the Gunn-Peterson uh, evolution of tau is a function of redshift that you can get by analyzing all these, uh, these uh, quasar samples, shows a, a, st a steady increase uh, uh, with respect to redshift, and then there's a very sharp uh, uh, rise here around redshift 6 that, that has a power even larger than 10. So this is, uh, this is very uh, important, and that is a, maybe is a signal that uh, we are entering into the reionization uh, epoch in the epoch of reionization uh, around redshift 6, where the gum peter, so the, the, the gas starts to become considerably uh, neutral. You can also transform this tau into, uh, using the formula that I showed before, in, uh, in, the, the, in the volume filling fraction of, uh, of H1. Again, it shows the same trend. So as you go to very high redshift, it looks like that the run between redshift 6 and 6.5, something dramatic happens. And uh, instead of uh, a smooth increase uh, in the gum peterson that you would expect from simply from the increase of the density, the, the mean density of the gas, now something uh, very dramatic increase that, that uh, pushes the optical depth to very large values and to uh, that signals that we are entering in the epoch of reionization.
So I think I'll, I'll stop here for today. So you have uh, five more minutes. If you uh, have questions, uh, I will be happy to take them. Given that I have a microphone, I can start. So uh, in the uh, ratio between hydrogen and helium in the IGM is, is a good tracer of the primordial one? Um, in what uh, tracer, in what sense? Sorry, in a I'm sense, it's, it's the same, is, is uh, the one that you calculate for nucleosynthesis or it's uh, The composition, you mean? The, 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 yeah, the ratio between hydrogen and, and helium. Ah, ah, okay. Uh, yes, the, so far there is no there is no indication from from the IGM that there is a that there is a, a in terms of the abundance there is a difference with respect to the primordial value. I have to say that in order to do this, you need to uh, correct for the neutral fractions, right? Uh, in my, if you want to compute the uh, true uh, nucleosynthetic ratio between helium and, uh, helium and, uh, and hydrogen, you need to, to do it for the total amount, so total number of helium, total number of, uh, um, of hydrogen. But what you see is essentially is only the neutral fracture, so you need to correct uh, for that. So it's, you know, you can do it, but it's a very uncertain measure. But there is no evidence that uh, no, I mean, no, looks no, compact. Within, within the errors, no. Actually, I also have a second question. Can, can <laughs> you, can you, re, uh, you showed the data for the UV background? Yes. But I didn't get uh, a trash zero. Is zero. Yes. How do, you, how do you get these measurements? Oh, these are essentially, you see, they are in the X-rays. See, these are, uh, if you look at there around, uh, 1 kV, uh, so you can, uh, from the X-ray background, you can uh, measure, these are essentially uh, Chandra and XMM data uh, from, from the background itself. You can measure the, the, spectral, the spectral evolution of the, of the, of the background. Harvest possible. So in the average over that B, it is average over what? So you should run average over, next, uh, next slide. The B? No, the, the next slide. Okay. Ne okay, so you should run average over B. Uh, I'm sorry, which B? B the Doppler parameter you mean? Yes. No, I'm saying that, uh, I was saying that uh, when you measure B, uh, in this case, you, 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 the B that you measure includes not only the thermal motion of the gas that, that related to the given temperature, but also to the bulk motion. For example, if you have, uh, you don't have turbulence, but you have something that is similar to turbulence, in which, for example, you have gas that is accreting onto the filaments, so you don't know exactly uh, if there are other, other motions that are not related to uh, random motion related to temperature. So, but when you measure, you measure both. So you, it's up to you, and that's why uh, there is a spread, I mean, there's a large spread here that is larger than what you would expect from the temperature alone. So there must be some other uh, component uh, due to bulk motions of the gas. And, but the fact that, uh, that you have, see, there seems to be a lower envelope, that means that this is the minimum amount of, uh, of uh, broadening that is related only to the temperature, and the rest is added by, by bulk motions. What I'm asking is, is this feature you've seen all the directions, like you. Yes. The, see, yeah. This is each point here. Are well. Each point is a different system uh, in different quasar spectrum. So you do it uh, for several quasars, and for each quasar you have several systems, right? So all these points refer to. I guess these are 19 quasars. The, they are well. I'm not sure. Well, these are this one. So three, six, nine, nine quasars, and each quasar a different system. So you put them all together. Also, in one of the slides, you have showed the. Sorry. In one of the slides. Yes. You have showed the average of that optical depth term. Yeah. So what is that average taken over? Yeah, this is the average over over all the observers that that the, all the abs absorption system that you have in the quasar spectrum. So each one, for each one, you can measure how much 
uh, flux is absorbed by, that, by the system with respect to what you would expect from the continuum. And then you measure, uh, you do it for each observer, in, you know, for each absorption system in your spectrum, and then you average over that. So it's an ensemble leverage. Okay, thanks. Any other question? Okay. <laughs> Running exercise. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, this is the this is a uh, budget baryon that it's a um, it's a complicated study because there are many uncertainties. But certainly, what we know, for example, what you do first, you start by uh, by checking the uh, the stars, right? So the first thing you do is check stars. And how do you do that? You have luminosity functions of galaxies. So you take uh, luminosity function is a function that explain that tells you. How many, uh, how many galaxies are per uh, unit luminosity, per luminosity bin, okay? So by integrating over this luminosity function, uh, you get all the light produced by the, those galaxies, but then you have to convert, and this is another uncertainty, light into mass, okay? Uh, and you do that by knowing what type of stellar population these galaxies made from, and so on and so forth. So you get the mass of the stars, so that is one, one. So you get the stars, and this is, at least you know for sure that all the stars here uh, can only make 10%. Uh, you do it for different type of galaxies. This exercise for ellipticals, irregulars, spirals. So you have the gas. Then you're left with uh, the rest of the gas. So uh, the hot gas is measured essentially through uh, two, two ways. The hot gas, you do it through X-ray observations. So again, you, for example, look the, particularly the hot gas in, in clusters, you measure through x-rays. So you know the x-rays, you have to convert, again, from light to mass. Uh, and for cold, cool gas, you do it uh, with uh, neutral hydrogen, so a 21 centimeter observations. So you measure all the amount of cold gas. There is this intermediate regime, which is, by the way, the, the one that is the most difficult to determine with temperatures between 10 to the 5 and 10 to the 6, which are too cool to produce x-rays and are too hot to produce 21 centimeters to, have, to be neutral. So these are essentially left. This is the most uncertain part, but this is what essentially you get it by subtraction. Well, once you have... Uh, Uh, well, you, you have the you have to comply. We have, the total has to be the omega baryon, right? That you have from different uh, constraints, for example, CMB or or any other. Uh, so the total, you know, the total, and and you have you 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 count all the components that you can measure. And there is only one that is very hard to measure, but that you can get it from subtraction. That is what we can do. Uh, for the density fraction density of H1, to what uh, it was measured to what uh, to what redshift in the picture when you put the the Gam Peterson? No, no, not the Gam Peterson. The the distribution, the the density of H1, the density the density ah. coding. This one. No, 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 the, 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 the column one. density distribution. Yes, no, 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 the density in function of redshift. I mean, uh, density as a function of redshift. Uh, okay, uh, density of neutral yeah, hydrogen no, fracture. Uh, so the uh, one of the last ones. Yes. Uh, okay. Is this one? No, no. You just passed it. I just passed. This one. Uh, yes. To the uh, to what? Uh, redshift, uh, because uh, we know that uh, at uh, higher redshift. Uh, the wavelengths get stretched and uh, we don't get any absorption. So how can we be accurate on? Uh... Well, uh, this has been obtained, uh, as I was mentioning before. Remember the way in which this is obtained, OK? So you take, uh, you decompose your, your observed spectrum into, into components. And for each one, you know the column density, 
the amount of gas that it has, and the B parameter. And then you simply take that value and you, uh, you do the distribution. Now, uh, you, can, you can obtain this function for different redshift. Um, and so typically, this, uh, this, got, this uh, measure has been obtained from redshift 2 to 5. Okay? Then if you go beyond 5, what happens is uh, the spectra become like this. Let me show you. Yeah. So the spectra, they don't show the Lyman alpha forest. So there's nothing you can measure, right? So yeah. you, don't, you don't have uh, features anymore. You see, it's, it's blank, yeah. dark. So you can only do it up to redshift. You're already at 5.7. You still see a lot, I mean, still see a little bit of the forest, but there's nothing comparable to the case of, of redshift 3 that I was showing before, in which the forest is obviously very evident at lower redshift, right? You see this one? Uh, here you have a lot of features. Uh, as you go to high redshift, this becomes blank, zero, right? So you can't do the experiment anymore. Okay. Yes? Correct. Well, in order, that strictly speaking, uh, the, uh, the, the full homogeneous uh, UV background is only established once the uh, the mean free path of all the photons becomes longer than the Hubble radius. That's the formal definition. So, so that uh, each point in the universe sees the same uh, intensity. Okay, and that is uh, the 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 mean. Actually, the we will see in the next lecture. But uh, the this condition is achieved essentially at reionization or slightly earlier, I should say. But uh, and that is around redshift six. So. If it depends on where you think realization has really ended, but so by the end of realization, uh, the mean free path of photon is comparable to the Hubble radius, and therefore you establish a, a, a truly homogeneous uh, position independent UV background intensity. Before that, there are still large fluctuations, and the more you go to high redshift, fluctuation become even larger. But the condition is that the mean free path of photon has to become equal to the Hubble radius in order to have a, a background. I think it's time for coffee. Let's uh, thank Andrea. Thank you.